Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, we have a great, ter uh, terrific panel of, of people here to talk with you all about what makes a great VP of engineering. So this is something I spend all of my time on, and I'm very passionate about this. I'm very uh, in it day to day. Uh, and I'm excited to share my thoughts, hear their thoughts, and get your questions. Um, we're going to ask questions to the panelists. And then we already see some, uh, some questions coming in on Slido here. So we'll make sure to have some time at the end to answer those. So I'm going to start off with asking all of you, what do you think, what qualities do you look for in any leader that makes that person exceptional? Let's start with Karthik. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, there are obviously lots of things that you look for in a great leader, but for me, the difference between uh, great and exceptional um, are people who can connect the dots in a particular subject matter way better than 99% of their peers, number one. But then number two, be able to communicate that very effectively across the broader team and elevate the level of critical thinking and execution of the entire organization with those you know, unique capabilities. And so to me, that's the difference between um, great and exceptional. Great. Holly Rose? Yeah, I would just add on to that, that uh, leadership kind of comes at different stages of the company in terms of, of what you're looking for. And it, it's different across each company depending on your industry as well. And so when I work with our portfolio companies and helping them think through who they need to hire, a lot of times we draw on the leadership skills that we need for a specific role by measuring it based off of what are the outcomes that this person needs to achieve in their first you know, 18 months to two years on the job, and then backing into what are those specific skills that will allow them to execute upon it. Thanks, Holly. Um, for, for any leader, um, including myself, um, what I'm looking for is somebody who can think about their role um, in support of their boss, in support of whoever they're working for. So think about their role in a broad context, has a model for thinking about the entire business, not just the function. So the really good leaders that I find are what I would call model builders, people who start with a model of the way things should work, can describe that to other people, enroll them in that, and then people can gauge their progress as they go along in that process. And I think that model starts, I find that as people get more senior, it's harder and harder for people to develop that model building capability and that communication. So those two things are pretty distinctive for me. So. And I'd say very related to that is just really somebody who's very intentional in the choices that they make. and. I think that does mean you need to create a model for yourself of what success looks like and what success is going to look like for your career, for your boss, for your company, and being able to push that intentionally throughout your career as you make steps. So given that most of the companies that um, the talent partners are working with and the two companies that the CEOs are working with are software companies, now how does that relate to and translate to a VP of engineering, right? Software engineering specifically. What do you, how does that executive leadership function now have to instantiate itself as a VP of engineering. Go ahead. So I, I want the VP of engineering to think that they want my job, even though nobody wants that job. But the idea being is I want to think about my role as it relates to the CEO, the broader organization. I want them to be not optimizing the subsystem of engineering, but optimizing delivery of the mission of the company. And it's a, really, it's a really subtle thing, but people who build an effective model and are able to communicate what that model is and what success looks like across the table with their peers and describe it in terms of the company's objectives as opposed to engineering objectives are super powerful. Really can have a huge impact on the company. And it's what I look for, and we just did, finished a long VP of engineering search, and that's exactly what I look for. So. Great, I think Brett, you had an answer. Yeah, I was just gonna say that like we spend a lot of time with seed stage companies who the founders leading most of recruiting and then we see them look for the first VP of engineering and then inevitably most companies look for a second VP of engineering. And I think the biggest difference between the first VP of engineering that a company hires and the second is really uh, what Evan just mentioned. It's how do they think about engineering as part of the whole of the organization and now you have a 100 person org, you have these strange people called product managers, you have customers, you have sales, like you have this business context that engineering lives in and the exceptional leaders are able to go from sort of that first engineering leader which, which can be super successful just optimizing a team, building one product, but getting to the point where 
you're optimizing the company, you're really figuring out what does sales need from engineering and layering that into your product plans and your engineering execution is really what makes people exceptional. Just to build upon that, I would also say what often we find across our portfolio companies is the VP of engineering is really coming in to, to lead the team so that the CTO can focus more so on, on the tech, technical architecture. So obviously there's a level of like tech, technical acumen that the VP of Eng needs to have. But the other thing that I have found across um, most of the searches I've been involved with is the ability for the VP of engineering to push back on the executive team and know when to do it in order to protect their team for the delivery and the output that they need to do. Because I think most people know, like, if you're working on something and it never gets released, I think it's an awful, an awful feeling. And so it's how do they stand up to the rest of the team? Um, and then on the flip side of that is then how do they manage their specific team in order to drive success? And so how do they structure their teams? And that obviously varies by, by company. There's, I think, one thing that we look for in a, in a great VP of engineering is someone who shines a light of transparency onto engineering from business and onto business from engineering. There has to be a conduit there because it can get kind of opaque sometimes. Um, I've been involved in VP of engineering searches at many companies at many different stages and no two searches have looked the same. Uh, you know, it's such a unique, it, it, the, what makes a great VP of engineering is so unique to the company, the stage, the culture and everything. Uh, we just finished a VP of engineering search as well about six months ago, and the way we were thinking about it is there are basically five dimensions that we were focused on. Um, you know, the first was just around process and systems, and if, every company is going to be different in terms of what they need for process and systems, depending on are they a SaaS company, consumer, you know, consumer web company, more traditional package software company. But you know, what are the relevant experiences, and does the individual have the right skill set to come in and help us from day day one on on that dimension? The second thing that we looked at was organization building capabilities. You know, does the individual at our stage and scale understand what it means to get to the next level, hire appropriately, build the right management structures, think about geographic expansion, and so on and so forth. Uh, the third was technical capabilities. And again, every company is unique in terms of what they need from a VP of engineering in terms of technical depth. We had a great CTO, and we, we didn't need a CTO type VP of engineering. We needed someone who could actually run and build and scale the team. Um, then the fourth is just cultural fit, primarily within the engineering organization to make sure that not only did they fit in with the things that we thought were great, but were they bringing a, an element of being a change agent in the places where we needed the organization to change. And then the last is fit within the broader executive team. What were we missing as an executive team that we needed to fill and, and how could this individual come in and really <coughs> plug that gap? So the way we were thinking about it is in those first three uh, process and systems, um, organizational growth um, and technical, really you, no one's going to be fantastic across all three of those and so you have to pick what do you really want to orient on uh, and every company is going to be unique on that but you have to be super strong at one of those things and find a company where that's what they need. And then the other two, just cultural fit within the engineering organization and then overall executive team fit, that's again just going to be unique and that has to be a fit as well. So that, that's how we were thinking about it. So you talked about hiring, and I've got three questions on how does a VPE recruit, right? So recruiting is one of the key, de key skills that this person has to be great at. What do you look for when you evaluate someone on recruiting? Yeah, so I think one of the most apparent things is, is are there individuals that they've worked with that they can bring over with them, right? Like, I think that's, that's one. That's not always the case, especially if it's your first time leading an engineering org. So it's then, how do you think about recruiting? How are you going to structure your recruiting process? How are you going to identify the target candidates? How are you going to get in front of them? How are you going to arrange the engineering team both from the interviewing work that they're going to need to help with, with still meeting their deliverables. And I think um, the other thing that's been critical from evaluating engineering leaders on recruiting is how quickly are they able to identify good talent, get them in the door, and close them. Um, I think more so than any other function, engineering you know, has, has the most demand. And so it's how can they close that gap the, the quickest. Anybody else? So I actually sort of take a, a backwards approach to things where 
whenever I'm talking to a candidate, I always try to get a sense of like how sticky are they going to be if you put a great engineer in front of them. And part of my job is to theoretically find great engineers and introduce them to a great VP of engineering. So I want to know, does this person do one-on-ones? Like, do they actually care about these people? Like, like how much of a person is this, this engineering leader going to be uh, a mentor as well as a boss for these people? And that's sort of table stakes. Uh, once we sort of, once I feel like that person's good at that, I think the recruiting side can be taught, provided somebody actually wants to spend time on it. Uh, we've been building out a bunch of materials internally for our seed stage founders who, off, these days, sometimes they've never, never had a job before. But like, what are the things you need to do over the first 10 weeks or the first couple of years of your existence as a company to be successful recruiting? turns out the things a founder needs to learn are the exact same things a VP of engineering needs to learn around storytelling, around uh, building a team, around sort of really thinking critically about what culture and processes you're going to just run your company by. Yeah, I think there are two or three things that are really important to me. One is, are they authentic? Like, are they consistent? Just when, they're, when I'm talking to them, are they congruent? When they talk about their past, what they've done, the different movies they've seen professionally, that sort of stuff, does it fit together? Do they feel like they're congruent? Do they feel like they're telling me a story or do they feel like they own the story? Two is, do they have emotional intelligence? Do they, are they capable of establishing rapport? Right? Are we, are we capable of having some, some way to connect? Can they, quickly, can they quickly establish rapport? And the third thing is super important to me is credibility, right? Do they sound credible? So if they're, you know, if, if they're technical acumen in a certain space, can they describe it? And for me, is I want to hear their model, how they think about that space. And so if I think about it, it's no different than any kind of other sales processes. If you're authentic, if you're emotionally intelligent, you can establish rapport, and you're credible, you're nine-tenths of the way from selling a candidate. I look for those things. And by the way, it's not just selling a candidate, recruiting. It's, by the way, it's enrolling their team in whatever they need to make happen. It's enrolling their peers, it's enrolling me. All those three characteristics are sort of my first gate. So one of the things that um, I think a lot of the folks in this room are wondering, it's up on the screen, and I think you know, tangential to this is, what do I need to do to get to be I'm a director now or a manager. What do I need to do to get to that VP level? So we call them step up or high potential you know, candidates. There are other folks there um, who have different names. What do you look for in that high potential? Someone who hasn't done it yet, but you think really could. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's a tough one because I, I'm a big believer that experience really does matter because it's a very, very different role when you're actually running the organization and the buck stops with you and there's no substitute for the experience you, you get you know, doing that. Um, but that said, you know, sometimes there are great opportunities to take a chance on someone who's an up and comer. Um, but to me, the, the biggest thing that I look for if I'm going to take a, a, a bet on someone like that is are they risk takers? Have they taken risks? Because the biggest, you, you can assess, are they smart? Are they capable? Do they have the skills? But what is really difficult to tell is once they're in, in the job and you hit that first roadblock, because you will, something that you haven't experienced before in, in the chair where you're running the organization, how are you going to react? Uh, and it demonstrated experience of taking risks, you know, whether that's moving into a, a role that is a really, really tough role that is maybe set up for failure, and how do you tackle that? Uh, if it's, you know, those are the sorts of patterns that I generally look for to see is this someone who is worth taking a, a, a bet on and taking a risk on. To me, that's the big, you know, question mark when you're hiring someone who doesn't have the experience. Other thoughts? Yeah, well, just one specific quality that I would add, because I think there's a lot you could dive into, is self-awareness. So how self-aware is the person of their skill set and, and where they fit into the broader landscape? And one of the questions I always, I always like to ask in thinking about um, an individual's specific you know, prior experience is walk me through an example of something in looking back like you wish you would have done differently and describe to me how you did what you did and then why you think it didn't work well. Um, and then as they're kind of going through their narrative, you can jump in with different questions. And then the follow-up question I like to ask is, what would you have done differently, right? And I think that question allows you to measure how much they're thinking about what they would have done differently and their level of awareness of, okay, this is what I should have done. I, you sought out specific people, gained feedback from them, but it'll tell you about how much they're able to um, adjust 
in you know given situations. Actually, so you always have this in an organization where you know you have one VP of engineering and you have four or five directors, and so and each director eventually would like to be a VP of engineering. But but what I would say to folks who are thinking about that path is, you act like a VP of engineering today, that you don't think that's something you're going for. And what I mean by that is. You're working across your peer groups. You're working across different functions. You're able to communicate broadly about what you're doing. You're able to communicate your status with high visibility. You, you drive towards consensus and moving teams forward. You can see people behaving in that role because what it takes for somebody to say, okay, here's, you know, here's the baton, you're the VP of E, is going, can we imagine this person in that role? And that's as simple as that is when you think about these folks is, can you imagine this person in that role? And the only way you get to imagine it is if you assume it first. And I think back to my, this, this theme, this ability to communicate and build a model about what you're doing, share it, make it transparent for everybody to see, is a really important step in that process. So. I'd just say, like, I don't think there necessarily is a skill you need to add if you are close to getting to that VP of engineering point from being a director. I think in a lot of cases it comes down to fit with the company and the opportunity you're moving on to. Uh, and I think at some point it does sort of come down to demonstrated ability to operate at the scale of whatever that next opportunity is. So if, you're, if you've only managed 12 people and like you probably have the skills to be able to manage much larger teams, but unless you've actually demonstrated doing that, it just is really hard for a company to bet the farm on you figuring it out on the job. And sometimes you have to go somewhere else to do it. Sometimes within a culture, within an organization, you can spend so much of your good energy trying to fit in and trying to make yourself work within that system when your better path is to find somebody who's willing to take a bet on you in a different culture and a different environment. There is a certain amount of permission that comes when you have the role, right? That doesn't come when you're not in the role. And sometimes it works out that way. So just to be aware. Yeah, and some, there are some people, uh, I've told this too in the room, but if you look at that next job, if you're a tech leader, a manager, a director, I always say we want to make that next job you get have the learn to leverage ratio as close to one as possible. So that numerator, if you're learning too much, they shouldn't give you the job. If you're leveraging too much, you shouldn't take it. Right? So you stretch yourself, not too much but don't be complacent in whatever you do. And, and that might be in your org, it might be somewhere else, it might be another company, it might be a different career. So, anybody else? One of the things that, one of the first questions was, what are the anti-patterns <laughs> for a VP of engineering? So we talked about the goods. Sometimes there are some things that it's just binary, right? If it's there, you're just not the right person. Got a lot of laughter, so hopefully there's some answers. <laughs> To me, and, th and this may be more personal than other, is you know, ego and arrogance are anti-patterns for me. Um, hyper arrogance makes the organization function. It actually creates an organizational dysfunction where you're not optimizing the whole company. You're optimizing the subsystem, and sort of arrogance, mm -hmm. a lack of openness, just immediate like dismissals for me. Yeah. One of the anti-patterns is someone who is really good at managing up, but not managing down, um, because you rarely ever see a team set up for success when you're always being managed down. Mood lighting. <laughs> was, was it really that shiny off my head? I, I couldn't Wait, tell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for those out there who are deciding, there might be some people um, who are deciding, should I be a VP of engineering? Should I take the managerial track or the technical track? Any thoughts on that? You've all worked with people who've done that. I mean, there's such different roles, right? I mean, when, when I interview people and, and, you know, in, in our engineering organization, you know, you'll get people who are asking lots of questions about our technology and they just really want to deep dive into the technology. And I find those people end up, you know, taking the technical track more often than not. And then I'll find junior engineers who are asking all sorts of questions about the business and how are we going to tackle the market and how do we think kind of more structurally about, you know, the business. and they've ended up taking the managerial path. So I think it just depends on what, what moves you, right? Um, and I think, and the other thing I would also say is it's, it's, it's not a decision that you can't unmake. It's, you know, it's, it, people sometimes think it's a permanent move and uh, if you're in a good organization, it never is. Any other thoughts? 
Um, I think one thing we look for when we're working with a candidate, do, do I think this person is a big E engineering leader or a little E big L engineering leader? A leader who was an engineer or an engineer who happens to be a leader? They're very different people. And so I think if you start to think about it, if you had 10 hours in a day, how much of those, how many hours, how much of that time would you really want to spend working on architecture and giving mentorship advice on technical topics? Just if you think about yourself, what do you enjoy doing? Which, which letter is bigger, the E or the L? So the question that's coming up on the middle of the screen uh, is, is diversity. Huge um, focus for all of us right now, as it should be. Um, and I know that all of us on the stage have um, been working on this. And I think it's a, it's a great topic. I'd love to talk about it. I think, Holly Rose, you have probably some thoughts on this. I'll start with you and then go there. Yeah, the question is, um what patterns work for women moving into these roles? How do you find those opportunities when you don't have obvious role models? It's a good question. I talk to women engineering leaders um, as often as I personally can. Um, but however, I think the natural, when you think of diversity in terms of a, of a male and female um, demographic, there aren't as, any, as many female engineering leaders. And so sometimes certain role models might not look like you or have the same background as you, but there's still people who are w willing to be a role model. And so I think it's finding someone who you admire based off of their specific qualities and skills and developing a relationship for them. Um, I think the patterns for women moving into these roles, networking, frankly, like call search partners, build relationships with search partners, build relationships with the talent partners at the firms. This is something that's very much on top of mind for, for all of them and just start kind of putting yourself out there more. Don't be afraid to, you know, go for a role that maybe all of the qualifications, you don't have all of them, still go for it. Um, those are what immediately come to mind. Any other thoughts? The other question that was related to diversity was how do you make sure you have diverse pipelines? And so I know all of you have done a lot of searches where we're focusing on that. Any tips there? We, we're, we're, we're conscious of both the, when we think about this whole, the whole recruiting dynamic and, and starting with, with women engineers and, and women executives, we're conscious that there is already a bias built into the market. And in order to correct for the bias built into the market, that we have to bias the other way. And so we go out of our way, whether it's earlier stage or coding skills or people out of college, to find really qualified women candidates and move them up. When we're doing an executive or a director level search, um, we go out of our way to make sure that our pipeline of, which is not easy, just to be frank with you, our pipeline of women um, engineering leaders is as strong as the men's side so that we we have to consciously counter the bias. And that's not just a discussion at my level with my HR, it's a discussion across my executive team. Like we have to consciously counter the bias. So I think that's all I can offer. Yeah. It's hard. When I take a step back and you think of what should a pipeline look like when working with companies, I see, okay, based off of the role and what we're looking for, what does the market look like? And do an entire market map of the individuals within that. Now, what is the makeup of the current market that exists? So if we use gender as an example, maybe it's 40% women and 60% men from the top of the funnel of the pipeline. Then I set the precedence with our searches that, okay, throughout the entire funnel, we need to make sure that we're at least keeping a 60-40 split so that the pipeline is reflective of what the market is. However, depending on the company, you can adjust those levers, right? You could have it be 50-50, you could have it be 70-30, whatever it is. But I think to first and foremost, like understand what the actual pipeline is from the get-go. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more thing, which is, it's very important to make sure that the criteria, that you pay very close attention to your decision criteria around how you're gonna select your VP of engineering. Obviously, the top of the funnel is important. You have to get a diverse candidate pool coming in. Um, and you know, to Evan's point, you really have to unbias as much as possible uh, the process. And, and that means you can't just have culture fit as a criteria and not pay a lot of really close attention to what exactly does it mean and have agreement. And, and as, a, as a CEO, you have to pay a lot of attention to driving consistency around that across your team. And if you don't, then that's when all of these biases 
uh, end up exposing themselves. So um, I think that's a really important part of the process as well. I would just also add to call people out on their biases, especially on the executive team level. So if you work with someone and you notice throughout the interview process it's a consistent bias, mm -hmm. flag it. Yeah. Right. I, I think related to the previous question, I think Evan's also right that uh, you do have to go other places to get the opportunities often in your career, and this applies to everybody. And there are sort of rough criteria that companies do look at to say like, are you somebody we should talk to or aren't you? And sometimes it's team size, sometimes it's technical acumen. Like there are you sort of there are these bars that you can actively push yourself over and then all of a sudden like you are considered for these jobs because of these sort of uh, non-specific, well, very specific, but uh, achievable sort of metrics that companies look at when it comes to building their engineering orgs. I'd also like to upvote something Holly Road says, which is network, find a mentor. People, uh, go to you're going to meetings like this, go to more of them, find that person. And also be a mentor as well. So people will call us, we'll have you know, female managers, directors of engineering say, I'd like a mentor. They call us and we'll connect them. You know, call the folks on the, on the panel here, call the people you trust. Because those people will get opportunities before we get them and they will, they'll keep you in mind. So we're, we're, we could go on for three hours on this, uh, if that's not obvious, but we're in the last minute. So I'll do a quick roundup and say, is there any other advice you'd give to the people sitting in the, in the audience here about how to become a great VP of engineering? Um, don't be afraid to take risk, take some chances, right? I mean, if, you, if that means moving to a different company and getting some experience and using that as a launching pad to learn and grow um, or taking a more challenging opportunity at your existing company, um, it, you know, don't be afraid to take risk. Mine would be ask for feedback. So ask for feedback from those that you trust in terms of what you do really well and what people wish you did more of. I'd say, um, I'd say reach out to reach out to the level that you expect report to. Find a couple of CEOs, have an intimate conversation, have a cup of coffee. How do you think about this role? Have those conversations, kind of like we're having here today. But find some people, whether it's through the portfolio, whether whether it's through the um, the different recruiting partners. Find some people you can have that authentic conversation about. Um, yeah, and I would just say. Like nobody happens to be granted the VP of engineering job. Like you have to be ambitious, like you have to push and you have to go and want it. And I think if you're, there's not many people early in their career here, but you need to have a manager that's pushing so you can go take their job and you can draft off of successful people. You need to be a manager that other people can draft off of. And if you aren't those things, like you're just gonna find yourself toiling away, doing good work and expecting to get recognized and that's just not gonna happen. So we're out of time. Really great advice, folks. Um, give a round of applause to our panelists. And thanks, everybody, for being here.